Hi, this is Jonas from vsjagos.com. In this tutorial, we are going to learn what we can do with the procedure defined in the process. In the previous tutorial, we learned that by declaring an impure function within the process, we could read and drive signals that weren't on its parameter list. Then we used this function, which we named counter expired, to simplify the code for each of our finite state machine states. The code is now a bit easier to read than when we first created this traffic lights module back in tutorial number 20. But still, some parts of the code, like this if statement, are being repeated over and over again with slightly different values. Actually, I'm not satisfied with the readability of this module yet. So I'm going to show you one more way to use subprograms to simplify the code even further. To get us started, I'll head over to the testbench file from the previous tutorial. I'll copy the code to a new file which I will save as t23 for tutorial number 23 underscore procedure in process tb.vhd. We also have to change the entity names from t22 to t23 underscore procedure in process tb as well. The last change we're going to make to this file is to change the instantiated device under test module from t22 to t23 underscore traffic lights, which will be the name of our new module. I'll go ahead and save the test page before we head back to the traffic lights module from the previous tutorial. I'll copy this code to a new file which I will name t23 underscore traffic lights.vhd. We also have to change the entity names from t22 to t23 underscore traffic lights. This will be our starting point for this tutorial. Let's first have a look at our current state machine code. What I want to do is to replace this whole if branch in every state with a single one line procedure call. The procedure call must perform the counter handling as well as the state change and the time delay and destination state must be configurable. We could declare the process in the architecture as we learned back in tutorial number 20. The only problem is that then we would not have access to the state and counter signals. Of course, we could solve this by adding them as inputs and outputs to the procedure, but this would mean more clutter in our state machine code than necessary. A better way is to declare the procedure within the state machine process. Then the procedure will automatically have access to all the signals within the scope of the process. I'll name this procedure change state because that's what it's going to do, it's going to change the state after a time delay. Inside of the parentheses, we'll specify the first parameter, which we'll name to state. This is going to be the state that the procedure will transition the state machine into. Therefore, the type of this signal must be our very own t underscore state type. The next parameter will be minutes of type integer with a default value of zero. The last parameter will be seconds, this two of type integer with a default value of zero. Then I'll complete the empty procedure by writing the is and begin keywords, and finally the end procedure tag. Now I could have used the functions that we already got, but I don't want to do that. Having a procedure which calls an impure function which calls another function is just making things more complicated than they have to be. Instead, I'll copy the if counter equals counterval then line from the counter expired function and paste it into our new procedure. Now I will have to replace this call to the counterval function. Let's head up to that function and first copy the total seconds variable declaration into the declarative region of our procedure in between the is and the begin keyword. Next, I'll copy this line, which is the assignment to it, and paste that into the first line of the procedure. Now, the total seconds variable will always be updated before the next line, where we're going to use its value. Actually, I'm going to declare another variable to store the number of clock cycles that we have to wait. Then, we're going to assign to the clock cycles variable total seconds times clock frequency hertz minus one. I'll just copy that from the old counterval function into our new procedure. Then we're gonna have to replace the call to the counterval function with the new clock cycles variable. We already copied all the code from the counterval function, so the clock cycles variable should be equal to whatever the function would return. If the value of the counterval signal is equal to the clock cycles variable, what do we want to do then? The answer is in the old counter expired function here. We want to reset the counter signal back to zero. Let's copy that. But we also want to do something more. We want to change the state signal to whatever value the two state parameter has. When counter equals clock cycles, it means that the specified number of minutes and seconds have passed, and it's time to change states. If the counter signal isn't equal to the number of clock cycles that we have to wait before changing states, we don't want anything to happen, because it's not time to go to the next state yet. We'll simply close off the if statement by using the end if tag. 
our procedure is complete so I'll go ahead and erase the impure function which we're not using anymore. And I'll also erase the countervalve function which has also been replaced by the procedure. Both functions have been replaced by this procedure that changes the state after a given time. Now we've got to update the state machine code to call our new change state procedure. Let's start with the first state which is the north next state. I'll type in the procedure call to change state. Inside of the parentheses we'll have to assign the parameter values. The first of the parameters is to state which I will assign start north to. Then I will copy the assignment to the second parameter which our procedure handles as well. Notice that here I am using two different methods of assigning to the parameters. For the two state parameter I simply pasted in the value which I want to assign to it. But for the seconds I specify the name of the parameter seconds followed by an arrow notation and then the assignment value. The first kind of assignment uses positional association to match the value with the parameter name. Because toState is declared as the first parameter, the compiler will assign the first positional argument that we supply to the toState parameter. The second type of assignment uses named association. We specify the name of the parameter and the order of the assignments doesn't matter. It's a name that determines which parameter gets the value. You can mix positional and named association as we are doing here, as long as the named assignments are coming after the positional ones. Otherwise, it's a compilation error. Okay, the call to the change state function replaces this if statement and the call to the old counter expired function. So I'll go ahead and delete it. Now the start north value will be assigned to the two state parameter by positional association. The seconds signal will be assigned to the seconds parameter by named association. We didn't assign anything to the minus parameter, so it will get the default value of 0. Now I will do the same for all of the other states, converting the if statements and function call to use our new procedure call instead. Alright, it's time to simulate. I'm saving, adding the new files to our model sim project, compiling, starting the simulation and adding the signals to the waveform. Then in a console to simulate for 5 minutes, I'll type run 5 min. When we zoom out we can see that the pattern looks like it did in the previous tutorial. That's because we haven't changed the function of the module, just the implementation. If we check the duration of the states we can see that the long one lasts for 60 seconds and the shorter states last for 5 seconds. Everything is working correctly. Let's have a look at the final code that we created. I'll open a new editor window so that we can have the new code to the right and the original traffic lights module to the left. The one that we first created back in tutorial number 20, which was about finite state machines. I'll scroll both windows down to the state machine code, so that we can compare them. Both modules are functionally identical. They both work and they behave exactly similar. However, I prefer the one to the right because the algorithm is not only shorter, but easier to read and understand. VHGL is a parallel programming language, which is hard enough already. If written without the proper structure, code will quickly become unmanageable. The solution is as always to divide and conquer. Factor out the complexity into modules and sub-programs. Your colleagues will thank you for that. You will thank yourself for that when you have to dive into the code half a year later to figure out a bug or something. This was the last video in the basic VSGL tutorial series. If you liked it, you can find more at vhglwiz.com. You can also follow VSGLWiz on Facebook. Until the next time, take care and keep coding.